Audiobook Title Mix Audiobook Collection August 19th, 2023 Title Weapon Seller in the World of Magic 428 to 432 by Snowstar Chapter 428 Weapon Transmutation As Shang Fu was discussing their next course of action at the border of Western Yen, meanwhile, at Genesis Weapon Store, Imperial City. Despite there being no customers for the past few days, the store was still kept open so that people know Mark is at his house. Usually, he sits at the counter and chats with his fiancée but right now, he is in his room. Of course, he wasn't sleeping. Mark was staring at a specific item in his inventory, and wondering whether it is really okay to destroy it just because he hates the Imperial family. The weapon is bound to Shang Fu, so, it can never be mine to use. It is quite possible that the weapon could escape the moment I let it out of the inventory. To sever its connection with Shang Fu and forcefully bind it to me requires a billion credits. I don't have such an amount of money to give to the system. Even if I have, I wouldn't still do it. This bow is not just worth it. Hmm. I can keep this with me and use it as a bargaining chip in the future but I will lose 25 million credits slash 125 million gold coins if I do that. But then again, either 25 million nor the Phoenix Empire would become important in my life. If only I could find a way to extract the materials and use them to build. Hmm? Wait a second. All of a sudden, something clicked inside Mark's head and he quickly went to the system store and clicked on the skills section. He then scrolled down to the bottom and explored the unique skills. He stopped scrolling down after finding what he was looking for. Yup, this is the one. His face beamed in excitement as he pressed his finger on the skill, Weapon Transmutation. Asterisk ding, 1 million credits have been deducted. Weapon Transmutation has been added to the skill section. Weapon Transmutation, level 1 with a touch on an item, the user could extract all the raw materials used in making it. Currently it only works on ungraded items. Cost, not applicable. CD, 12 hours. Seeing level 1 glowing beside the skill name, Mark wasn't discouraged by its description and clicked on the level. Asterisk ding, proceed for the upgrade? 1 million credits will be deducted. Yes. Mark proceeded without hesitation. Asterisk ding, 1 million credits have been deducted. Weapon transmutation skill has been upgraded to level 2. Mark read its new description. Hmm. The upper limit is increased to bronze. Let's continue. Asterisk ding, 1 million credits have been deducted. Weapon transmutation skill has been upgraded to level 3. Asterisk ding, 1 million credits have been deducted. Weapon transmutation skill has been upgraded to level 4. Asterisk ding, 1 million credits have been deducted. Weapon transmutation skill has been upgraded to level 5. Okay, I reached platinum but it isn't enough. From here, the fee will increase but it's alright. I have enough credits anyway. Asterisk ding, 2 million credits have been deducted. Weapon transmutation skill has been upgraded to level 6. Asterisk ding, 3 million credits have been deducted. Weapon transmutation skill has been upgraded to level 7. Asterisk ding, 4 million credits have been deducted. Weapon transmutation skill has been upgraded to level 8. Damn, the price is getting skyrocketed for the divine grade items. But it doesn't matter. I will sacrifice all of the semi-divine weapons if I have to earn more credits. Let's proceed. Asterisk ding. 10 million credits have been deducted. Weapon transmutation skill has been upgraded to level 9. Asterisk ding. 20 million credits have been deducted. Weapon transmutation skill has been upgraded to level 10. Asterisk ding. 30 million credits have been deducted. Weapon transmutation skill has been upgraded to maximum level. 74 million credits. 370 million gold coins. Mark couldn't help but stare at the remaining balance in a daze realizing that he had indeed spent too much. It was then he remembered about a certain side quest. System, open the quest list. Side quest 3, spend a total of 100 million credits in the system store, 99.2%. Reward, Staff of Blessing, the Lamp of Wishes. Well, in the end, despite trying to postpone it in order to save money, I almost completed it after all. Should I go ahead and purchase something now? Mark fell into thinking. The war is almost over and Alina would still need a few upgrades to qualify to help him now that she lost her weapon. Of course, he can still give her another semi-divine weapon but none of the possessed items were suitable to her as the doomed scythe. Anyways, let's not care about those things right now and focus on the present. We will handle one problem after another. Mark doesn't know the exact reason but he just doesn't want to resurrect Alina yet, at least not before he takes revenge against her culprit, the necromancer king. In the end, 
he abandoned the idea of completing the quest and closed down the window. He opened the skills once again. Weapon transmutation. Max with a touch on an item of any grade, ungraded god. The user could extract all the raw materials used in making it. Cost. Not applicable. CD. 5 seconds. Mark clicked on the skill and activated it. Asterisk ding. Touch the object you desire to use the skill on. Open inventory. He clicked on the bow. Only details appeared. Asterisk ding. You need to physically touch the object for it to work. The system reminded him without asking. I see. Mark nodded and then took a deep breath before summoning it to the outside world. The Imperial Phoenix bow probably realized the situation. A powerful screech escaped from the bow while it turned into hot flames. Ugh. Mark groaned in pain but it only lasted for a second before the majestic bow was surrounded by the golden glow and eventually turned into specks of light. Asterisk ding. The Imperial Bow of Phoenix has been salvaged. Asterisk ding. You extracted 2.8 kilograms of adamantium, 12.4 kilograms of mithril, phoenix orb, 78% purity, 40 kilograms of heavenly jade dust, and the hair of the white dragon emperor. Check out your inventory. A phoenix orb? Heavenly jade's dust? Mark, open the inventory and click on the raw material he was hearing for the first time. Phoenix orb. Purity. 78%. Description. An orb that contained the energy of the mythical beast, Phoenix. The purity has been lost because of the mixture of the energies of various wielders across history. Effects. The orb can be used in making a semi-divine or higher grade weapon. It can also be directly consumed by the user to acquire the Phoenix bloodline, although the process has a high risk of death. Heavenly Jade Dust. Status. Crystalline. Weight. 40 kilograms. Description. An element found only in the celestial plan. Jade Crystal is the god's equivalent version of the Aether Crystal. Effects. Useful in making mithril and celestial grade items. Useful in making an aphrodisiac that works even against the gods. Reading the description made him remember the Aether Powder he unlocked in the gallery. A doubt rose in his head. He asked System. I want to know the grade of Aether Crystals your Aether Powder is made of. The System was ready with its reply. Asterisk ding. After extracting the ether energy from the crystals, the system prepares the ether powder as follows. 1. Copper grade ether powder is purely a powdered form of a low grade ether crystal. 2. Silver grade ether powder is purely made from middle grade ether crystal. 3. Gold grade ether power is a mixture of middle grade and high grade ether crystals with a ratio of 3 to 1. 4. Platinum grade ether powder is the same mixture as earlier but the ratio this time is 1 to 3. 5. Semi divine grade powder. Diamond, crystal, and ruby is purely made from the powdered form of high-grade ether crystals. 6. Mithril grade needs peak-grade ether crystals. 7. Celestial grade ether powder can be made from various elements like the heavenly jade crystals, black jade crystals of the hell realm, obsidian of the mortal plane, Qing Jing and Jinju of the undying lands, and so on. The system prefers to use the jade crystals of heaven. A. God-grade ether powder can only be made from cosmic dust also known as interstellar dust from space. Obsidian? Are you fucking serious? Mark's jaw dropped in shock as he saw that obsidian powder is used to make celestial grade weapons. Obsidian is nothing but volcanic glass that is formed when lava cools rapidly and solidifies without crystallizing. It is most commonly found in areas where volcanic activity has occurred and is probably the easiest to acquire. Damn, I should have asked you about this earlier. By now, I would have collected tons of obsidian from all over the world. Chapter 429. Mark demands the emergency assembly. Thirty minutes later, Emperor Shang Fu ordered the withdrawal of troops. Sixty minutes later, the Demon King made a visit to Mark and handed over the divine grade weapon, the bow staff, as he cannot take it with him to his world. This weapon. Mark frowned as he read the details. It turned out to be Rijin Bang, the weapon of Sun Wukong from the legends. However, it was slightly a disappointment for Mark as a weapon with such legendary status is nothing but a low-quality divine-grade item, mithril-grade. Mark kept it in his inventory as he has yet to decide what to do with it. The system recommended it for Alan but as he already had a better divine-grade weapon, Mark felt like it doesn't make any sense to hand it to him. At the same time, he couldn't extract raw materials through weapon transmutation or dismantle them through devil hand because of the availability of upgrades. As long as he uses superior grade upgrade stone on it, he could upgrade it to celestial grade. Then, he can decide whether he should dismantle it or not. After sending away the demon king back to his realm, Mark then thought about his next move. But as it cannot be rushed, he waited for the right time. 
About seven to eight hours later, Emperor Shang Fu and the other officials reached the Imperial City, which is currently protected by the second prince and his troops in the absence of the emperor. It was already dark by the time he arrived and he was probably so affected by the result of the war that he forgot about informing Mark regarding the death of Wu Wei Bao. He slept without eating any food that evening. However, Mark was quite happy to not get any formal letter from the Imperial Palace. He felt like he found an opportunity to get into a feud with the Emperor. The following morning, Feng Wu's messenger turned official ambassador, Huifen, along with his royal tutor arrived at the palace with their official proposal of peace, although it's more like a list of demands. According to it, the entire Western Yen, which used to be in the control of the Feng dynasty before it was overthrown by the Phoenix Empire, will be handed back to them. The Phoenix Empire will not only formally acknowledge Western Yen as an independent kingdom, but also give a written guarantee that the Empire's army will never start an unprovoked war in the future. As a part of compensation for looting the Feng dynasty for several years, the Phoenix Empire shall be giving 1 million gold coins a year for the next decade. Finally, the Emperor or any prince shall attend the coronation ceremony of the king which is happening in two days of time. In return, the war will be stopped. All the hostages will also be released. Of course, the royal tutor of Western Yen didn't forget to add that there were no negotiations on their terms. It's all or nothing. Emperor Shang was trying his best to control his rage this time. He wanted to kill both of them. But he couldn't do it as it will only invite doom to the empire with the loss of two divine grade items and Song Tai turning mortal. In the end, he agreed to the conditions and stamped the imperial seal right away. After their job is done, both of them left the palace and made their way toward the Hanga district, located in the outer sector of the Imperial City. As Mark already knew about their visit beforehand, he opened the store. Good morning, welcome to Genesis Weapon Store. Alan greeted the customers with a genuine smile on his face. He was really happy to see someone coming in even if it is a familiar face. Mark was also happy but for a different reason. As the android greeted the customers, his master spoke. I was waiting for both of you. His Highness ordered me to give this to you, replied Huifen as he took out a storage ring from his pocket and placed it on the desk. Mark grabbed it and poured his consciousness into the ring to check the contents. It didn't have any treasures or gold as Huifen expected. There were only the destroyed robots and weapons inside. But Mark exactly wanted them too. He specifically instructed Feng Wu to collect them and send them back after the war is over. The system could repair them for a fee, but Mark is interested in studying them in his free time. As for why he couldn't just buy it and break it down to study them, Mark had that thought a couple of months ago, but the system warned him not to do that as it is considered disrespectful. Mark cannot go against the invincible, stubborn, and sassy system head-on. Hence, he could only find loopholes and exploit them. After confirming that the goods were there, Mark bid farewell to the both of them without intending to talk about their affairs for too long. He was aware that there are spies watching his store for a couple of days. As they left, Net's spy on the roof of a nearby residence quickly took out a special note from his pocket and wrote something with ether energy. Some time passed away and the sun reached its peak position. Once again, the spider-shaped spaceship made its appearance at the Imperial Palace, this time without any appointment, or so whatever. Perhaps, the Imperial family has already guessed the reason for his visit. They sent the second prince to escort Mark and Alan to the Emperor's private chamber. However, Mark's intentions were never about claiming compensation, asking for an apology, or something. He wanted to break off the relationship with the imperial family he developed until now. Hence, he had to act like he was mad. Giving off an angry look at the noble second prince, Mark rejected to have a private talk with the emperor and further said, General Shang, the things I wanted to talk about. I needed the imperial courtroom. Would you be able to arrange a full audience of the ministers right now? At the very least, Nyeragang should be here. Is this about Venerable Wu? Asked the second prince, wondering whether Mark wants to complain or something. To which, Mark shook his head in response, not exactly. Then, as the second prince tried to press for the truth, Mark replied, I will only say that in the court. Brother Lu, his majesty isn't in a situation where he can attend the courtroom session. And suddenly summoning the ministers without telling anything to them might create unnecessary panic. Please understand then. As the second prince was trying to convince Mark to attend a private meeting with the emperor instead, Mark interrupted him with a statement. I'm a weapons seller, and I cannot prefer one over another. Everyone who walks into the store is a customer no matter what kind of relationship I have with them. This is what the motto is. I put my ethic aside for the sake of the imperial palace, and sacrifice the supreme being. 
I should deserve at least this much, right? This, chapter 430. I'm not here to seek answers. Sometime later, the six ministers and other important officials were arriving one after another, and found Mark standing silently at the center of the court. Sean Wen was standing beside him. Mr. Lu? What are you doing here? Is everything all right? Asked the current patriarch of the Lin clan, Lin Wuying. However, Mark didn't speak a word. He just folded his hands and stared at the throne in silence. As Lin Wuying gestured for Sean Wen to ask what this is all about, the general of the south could only shake his head, indicating he has no idea. The officials started murmuring as they were glancing at Mark every once in a while. Soon, the crown prince and the third prince also arrived with the emperor. Until Shang Fu sits on the throne, Mark was mute and turned a deaf ear to his surroundings. He was in fact conversing with the emperor in his mind, going through the series of possibilities and how he should respond to each statement. The last time he came he failed. But this time, he won't fail. Greetings, your majesty, spoke Mark in an unpleasant tone. The disrespect is clear in his behavior. Sighing inwardly, Shang Fu nodded and said I was informed that you want to speak in the presence of everyone. What is it? Mark finally opened his mouth. Your Majesty, let me start with something obvious. Two days ago, we made a deal. I lend you Wu Wei Bao for a day and in return, you pay me six million gold coins and one high-quality semi-divine weapon, ruby grade, after the war. Then, yesterday, you start the war and then decided to end it. You happily make a peaceful pact with the enemy after costing the life of Song Tai Tu. You didn't honor your promise. Wu Wei Bao died for no cause. I didn't get to bury him. And the imperial family didn't even bother to send me a letter. He raised his voice as he asked, why I had to hear the news of the death of Wu Wei Bao from your enemies. Tell me. His voice sounded like thunder as he echoed in the courtroom. The minister shuddered for a moment, and the emperor was forced to stand up in shock. He realized that he was so engrossed in the humiliation from the defeat that he forgot to inform Mark about the matter. Seeing the emperor looking at the floor in silence while tightly gripping the handrest, Mark pushed him further. Do you think he is a hired mercenary? He is a supreme being. Maybe you don't care because he is not a servant of the imperial family. Or is it because you just didn't believe my words and thought that it is impossible to have two supreme beings on the side of the enemies? Owner Lu, the thing is. The third prince wanted to speak on behalf of the emperor but Mark didn't give him such an opportunity. He raised his hand, gesturing for him to stop. As Sham Wei shut his mouth, Mark said, Whatever reason you might give me. I don't want to hear it as I'm not here to seek answers but to relieve my frustration and leave the judgment to your subordinates. Please sit down and listen. Yesterday, I lost a servant who can even win me a kingdom. So, I think I deserve at least that much. His nine points of charm worked very much on the third prince and the other listeners. They stayed silent and let Mark speak everything he wants. Mark felt secretly happy that his plan is working very well. He decided to use his charm to its full extent and make sure to create an atmosphere of distrust in the courtroom by the time he leaves. Mark then returned his gaze toward his biological father once again and continued, Now, coming to the second matter. Nia Regang, please stand up. Yes? Nia Regang's heart skipped a beat for a second, wondering what this man man wants with him. As far as he can remember, there is no personal grudge between the both of them except for the fact that he hired the Susek to attack the third prince once and Song Yu almost died that day. However, Mark went on to speak about a completely different matter. Without looking at him, Mark spoke on the dawn of the day during the time when the Western Yen is captured. A few powerful assassins of the organization named Seoul tried to assassinate a friend of mine named CMA. After digging around, I found out that you are the one who gave them the task. Do you accept my accusation or deny it? At that instant, Everyone's gaze fell on Nyera Gang. Meanwhile, sweat beads appeared above the forehead of the crown prince. The minister of revenue looked in the direction of the nervous prince. The crown prince quickly reacted by rising to his feet and started acting as if he was betrayed. Minister Nye, you are still in touch with that middleman? I told you that he is a bad business. Look where it got you now. Prince Sushi, please explain yourself. The emperor reacted for the first time. He was displeased upon realizing that his son was really involved with that mysterious terrorist organization. Previously, he thought it was something Shang Wei made it up and only put his son under investigation. However, he wasn't serious and was only trying to ease up the successor that he decided on. But it looks like he had to take this seriously. The crown prince turned toward his father and bowed, I apologize, your majesty. I want to keep this under wraps but I had to reveal the truth now. The truth is that I and Minister Nye have been in touch with the Seoul organization for a while. 
We regularly use them to eliminate the rebellious elements to safeguard the empire from the shadows. I was afraid of getting punished by revealing it to his majesty, and it is a huge crime to lie to his majesty either. So, I could only keep it a secret. After the arrest of Song Yun, the revenue department was put under heavy scanner, and we couldn't use the funds to do the job anymore. Hence, we decided to stop. But not so long after, Minister Nye met a stranger who somehow knew about our relationship with the Seoul organization. He brought missions and used to give him a 25% commission. I was against it as it is too risky, but Minister Nye thought that we can resume our operation using those funds coming from the middleman. I told him to not trust strangers who unnecessarily give too much money, but he didn't listen. Your Majesty, I request you to forgive him for his mistake. Minister Nye is working for the welfare of the empire even if it is something that didn't reward him. As the emperor's gaze softened, the crown prince then shifted his attention to Mark and apologized to him while putting aside his ego. Rather than denying the facts, he thought it is better to cook up a story on the spot. More than easing up his father, he was afraid of this weapon seller who doesn't care about the background of his enemy and just go wild. Chapter 431 Forsaking the Homeland In the eyes of the crown prince, Mark might not be strong enough to defeat the entire imperial army, but his weapons could definitely kill him. Shan Zixi loves his life, and he wants to be safe than sorry. Mark was also quite surprised by how convincing the crown prince's story was, but he had something up his sleeve to counter that. Turning toward the crown prince, he then replied, Suppose you are sleeping on your bed. Suddenly, someone tries to kill you but you escape and catch the culprit. The culprit turns out to be Alan. When you confront Alan, he says that he was ordered by me. Then, you come to me and I say that I was given money by someone to put a bounty on top of you. Even if that someone gets caught, will you leave me and Alan if we simply apologize and say it wasn't on purpose? Or you will put us under trial? That's, the crown prince fell into a dilemma, whether he should abandon Nye Rugang or not. It is a fact that Nye Rugang did this behind his back and he was angry at him for this but they are in cahoots with each other in every crime they committed. If Nye Rugang opens his mouth, forget about succeeding his father, the crown prince should worry about his own life. As a result, he felt like he had two options to choose. 1. Burn the bridges and kill Nyeragang. 2. Continue to stick with him by trying to cool down the weapon seller while putting aside his ego once again. Shang Zixi had chosen the second path, and he cupped his fists once again and bowed, Minister Nye has made a mistake. But in these times of chaos, he is necessary for the empire. I hope you forgive him as long we compensate you with material wealth. If Mark takes that offer, he would lose the excuse of acting against the imperial palace. But he cannot just show a stuck-up attitude when one is in a high position such as the crown prince bowing before him in front of everyone. Hence, he waved his hand and continued to be stern. As I have told you guys earlier, I'm not here to seek compensation or answers. Since you have already accepted my accusation, let me continue. There's more to listen? The third prince and the emperor felt a headache, not knowing how to deal with this troublesome fellow. The crown prince sat down and Mark continued by returning his gaze to his biological father. Thirdly, I want to tell you the reason behind my settlement in the imperial city. It wasn't because of the business. Then, everyone curiously stared at him, wondering what it might be. Mark then revealed half of the truth. When I was 15 years old, a burglar intruded into our house, ransacked our money, and killed my parents. The authorities kept their mum and the nobles disregard the incident as it is something common in their eyes and the lives of commoners aren't a big deal in the eyes of people. Like you? Back then, I'm powerless. But today, I'm not. I went against my fate and attained the power I desired. I came here to find out the killers of my family. But later on, I discovered that the killers are none other than the assassins of the Seoul organization and the one who gave them the mission is the Grand Secretariat, Lee Jim Kong. This time, the shock was so great that every single official stood on their feet. Even the emperor is no exception either. And obviously, Shang Fu didn't believe those accusations just like the rest of them. This time, he defended his late minister, there's no way Grand Secretariat Li was involved in. As he was speaking, he suddenly remembered the word traitor on the forehead of Li Jingkong. Shang Fu then changed his words to a question, are you the one behind his death? Prepared for such a question beforehand, Mark shook his head, no, I'm not. I only found this out today. I always had suspicions that someone from the imperial family is involved but I didn't expect it to be the grand secretariat of all the people. Feeling out about Mark's explanation, Shang Wei then asked a series of questions, who told you that? What evidence do you have against grand secretariat Li? And most importantly, 
Why do you suspect that someone from the imperial family is involved in the death of your parents? They were just normal people and even lived far away from us. How were they related to our family? Mark pointed his finger at the emperor. The man sitting on the throne is the one they had a relationship with. As for the one who told me the truth, it was the contracted demon of Feng Wu. He claimed that when he killed the Grand Secretariat and saw his memories to find out any useful intel about the experts supporting the throne, he found out that Grand Secretariat was following the orders of the late Dowager Empress and killing all the women who this noble emperor had violated so that his dignity remains intact in the eyes of the public. Even their children aren't spared. If I tell you that the number of such women is more than 100, would you believe it? If I tell you that more than 40 children born with the blood of Shang were killed, would you believe it? And one of those pitiful women was my late mother, who served in this imperial palace as a maid. She left this city and married my father, later on. Their happiness became complete when I was born to them, and we were living a peaceful life until your grand secretariat found out her existence, and sent the assassins. Had I not been rescued by an expert that day, I would have died that day with my parents too. The moment I learned of the truth, I want to massacre every single person from your family but those who are directly responsible passed away. And attacking you people will just make me a traitor of my motherland. However, I'm too disgusted with the actions of his majesty that I cannot sit by and ignore them as if nothing happened. Hence, today, I'm here to spill the truth in front of everyone before leaving this place for good. I received a marriage proposal from the Western Moon Kingdom a while ago, and soon, I will be engaged to Princess Xinling. It'll be my new home. But despite my feelings, I will keep my word and fulfill the conditions of every agreement I made with the Imperial Palace. If your army requires my firearms, your representative may visit the store and purchase them as a customer. I won't mistreat my customers no matter who they are. Now that I have said everything I want to, it is time for me to leave. Goodbye, your majesty. This might be the last time I will be addressing you as such. From tomorrow onwards, you are no longer my emperor and I'm no longer your citizen. Leaving everyone in a daze, Mark turned around and started walking away. His footsteps are probably the only sounds that the officials could hear at the moment. And surprisingly, the emperor was the first to come out of his stupor and called him out. Wait, Shang. Lusion. Stop. Mark continued to walk away, not noticing the slip up from the emperor. On the other hand, Shang Wei fell into deep thought, analyzing the known truths and the ones Mark spouted earlier. Chapter 432, Shang Wen's Opinion. Emperor Shang didn't follow Mark and neither did he order anyone to stop him either. He just collapsed on the throne with a look of disappointment. The ministers and the officials stayed silent as they don't know what to say now. They want to say that Mark is a liar but deep down, they were aware that their beloved emperor is a skirt chaser back when he is a young man. It is just that they don't know that the number is so high. What's more, Grand Secretariat Lee and even the emperor's mother was involved in something like this? It was also a shocking thing for them. As they looked at each other to say something, in the end, the Minister of Law Justice, the Jean clan's patriarch was forced to speak out the voices of his fellow ministers. Your Majesty, please tell us that he is lying. If the citizens hear of this matter, they will lose their trust in the Emperor. There will be protests. He raised his voice slightly but then followed with an apology. The Emperor was unresponsive and this made the Zhou clan's patriarch, the Minister of Board and Rights shakes his head in realization and speak his voice aloud. He cannot because it is true. The rest of the officials who were mere spectators started murmuring among themselves. Excellent, Minister Zhang, you perfectly hit the iron when it is hot. The crown prince thought in his head and tried his best not to smile. If there was someone who was very celebrating over this fact, it was the crown prince. In his mind, he was preparing to dethrone his father and ascend it before Shang Wei gets an opportunity. Rising to his feet, he addressed the rest of the officials. Everyone is dismissed. Please return to your homes. Slowly, the room was cleared and only the imperial princes and by soon remained with the emperor, who was resting his elbows on his knees while grabbing his forehead. Bai Sun walks up to his brother-in-law and patted his shoulder. Your majesty. Emperor Shang raised his head. He was trying his best to keep to not crying but sorrow was clear on his face. His voice turned hoarse as he said, I cannot believe Li Jing Kang and my mother do this to me behind my back. Li Jing Kang was a friend I trust with my life and all my secrets. How could he do this to me? I made mistakes when I was young, but I planned to rectify them by giving them the concubine status. However, they started disappearing one after another. Li Jing Kang told me that they ran away because of the fear of the society, but I had no idea that they were being hunted down. Father, why must you behave like you are guilty when it is the fault of that traitor Li Jing Kang? 
commented the crown prince, trying to gain some points with his father. He further added with wise statements, and people make mistakes all the time. Which ancestor of ours didn't make such mistakes? The fact that you are feeling guilty about your past actions itself is something admirable. Most rulers don't even have the heart to acknowledge it even to themselves. Shang Zixi. Emperor looked like he was touched by the support given by his eldest son. He couldn't help but look at his other sons. The third prince stayed silent as he was too busy thinking. As for the second prince, he always considers himself a soldier when standing in the presence of his father. Hence, he had to keep his mouth shut in the courtroom. Even now, he stood there like a soldier without showing any emotion but the emperor wants to hear that he isn't wrong out of this righteous son's mouth. Say something, Shanwen. He urged the second prince to speak. The second prince replied in a calm manner, Forgive me, your majesty, if my words indicate any disrespect toward you, but you are the emperor and the role model for your citizens. The commoners treat you as a god in human flesh. Several schools of thought are trying their best to empower women all over the world, but you treat them as a sexual object? You have a sister who is married to Supreme Commander Bai. You also have a daughter who will marry a noble or a prince of other lands someday. What would you have done if those people will follow in the same footsteps as you? Can you swear on your soul that you won't get angry and try to understand them? But then again, the past is the past and just being guilty about it doesn't change anything. If you want to repent then, you should at least compensate their families with material wealth along with an apology letter written by your hand. At the same time, you should also search for the victims who are still alive. It is possible that your illegitimate children are living somewhere. Regardless of your actions, I will still safeguard the southern provinces with my life. I'm a servant to the imperial throne and I will not abandon my duty as long as I'm not retired. This is all I have to say. Shanwen, how could you talk like that? The crown prince flared up at his brother as usual. Of course, this time, there's a motive. He wants to get into his father's good books. To which, the second prince responded with a long statement, The longer you live in the darkness, the more sunlight will get painful. You would want to go back into darkness as you will be afraid of the sunlight. But when you decided to face it and bear it for a while, you will be able to witness what the world has to offer. The truth is something similar, Prince Sushi. Shan Wen's words of wisdom made the emperor realize something important. It was as if his mind became too clear and all muddled thoughts vanished in an instant. The depression around him was gone and a look of determination appeared on his face. Rising to his feet, he spoke, call back the ministers and the officials who left. Inform them that I'm going to make an important announcement. I need Shang Bo, the empress, and the two queen consorts to be present too. And Shang Wen, your majesty, you follow me to the ancestry hall. The rest will stay here, said the emperor as he stepped down from the throne and walked toward the exit. Leaving behind everyone in confusion, the father and son pair left the courtroom. They took several lefts and rights in the palace before reaching the ancestry hall, where the paintings of the past emperors were displayed on the walls along with the statue of the founder. Shan Wen didn't know why they came here but he didn't question him and just followed him in silence. His curiosity did increase when the emperor told him to shut the door. However, for the next minute, Emperor Shang just stared at the founder as if he was in deep thought. Shang Wen patiently waited. The silence finally ended when Shang Fu raised his hand and looked at the ring around his index finger. Title System versus Rebirth, 809 to 811, by Fixed In. Chapter 809 Plan The girl introduced herself as Sandra. Her situation was similar to Tristan, who was sold by their parents for the sake of some money so that their family could survive and they promised that they would follow Noel on his trip until they returned with him to the Muvel Kingdom. However, before they continued their journey, Noel showed them three problems they had to discuss first. First of all, we are still going to the city to restock our supplies. Since we have two more mouths to feed, we have to get more supply than necessary. Hence, Tristan will go with me to resupply. Noel pointed at Tristan instead of Dimitri. Huh? Dimitri frowned. Master, if you want to resupply then I will go with you. No. It's better for you to stay here and protect Sandra. I'm planning to check the condition in the city as well. But, Dimitri contemplated. He had several reasons to stop him, but he only mentioned the most important one. Although Tristan can go, he might be recognized as a slave. If someone recognizes him, you'll be in trouble without a doubt. That was right. If the slave merchant or the townspeople recognized him, they would definitely bring Tristan back and cause some trouble for Noel. That's easy. Noel waved his hand to Tristan asking him to come over. Once Tristan stood in front of him, Noel grabbed the chains and iron bracelets before pouring his spiritual energy. With the skill old Rue taught him, 
Noel enveloped the outer layer of the iron bracelet, while maintaining the spiritual energy so that it didn't burn Tristan's skin. In just three seconds, everything melted into nothing. Instead of cutting it or breaking it apart, Noel actually melted it. After that, he took off his masquerade, showing his true appearance. Tristan and Sandra gasped because they never thought that Noel wasn't that much older than them. Yet, he was already this strong. And with the fact that Noel was the author of the rune book, Tristan knew that following him wasn't a mistake. Before they could say anything, Noel put the masquerade on Tristan, changing the color of his hair and eyes. With this, Tristan shouldn't be recognizable from those two alone, which caused the people to doubt it. This should be fine, right? Noel asked. Dimitri couldn't say a single thing. On the one hand, he was worried about Noel, who had to take off his masquerade. On the other hand, this wasn't the Muvel Kingdom, so no one should recognize him. Ultimately, Dimitri nodded his head, showing his approval. Seeing how Tristan was going to do all the work, Sandra felt empty. She had been trying to die this whole time without abandoning her humanity, but she was swept away by the situation earlier and ended up agreeing to become Noel's worker. She didn't know what they should do from this point on. I, Sandra suddenly opened her mouth and begged Noel, please let me do something too. Noel and Tristan turned to her. Tristan objected, no, you don't have to do anything. Just let me do the rest. This time, I'm the one going to take care of you. Sandra wanted to refute him, but Noel asked, even if I want to ask you, can you do anything? Do you have any special qualities? That's, Sandra couldn't answer that question. She was just a normal person. Tristan smiled. In the past few weeks, you have been the one taking care of me. You give me a reason not to give up and continue to live on. So please. Sandra looked unwilling, but she had no choice but to agree. Seeing Sandra's face, Dimitri couldn't help but ask, how about I train her to be a maid? The Artigan family has three levels of maids and butlers, outer, inner, and personal. The outer is a normal maid who handles all the gardens and chores. The inner level is those who have at least basic knowledge and skill, including martial arts. They are usually placed around the mansion so that they can help the family in case of emergency. The personal maid is like a combat maid. Not only do you need all kinds of skills, but you also need high combat prowess to protect your master. I am your personal butler assigned by your father, master. Ho, oh, this was the first time he heard about it. As expected, he only learned the surface of how to manage a family. By creating a lot of layers, it would be hard to shake the family. If she learns from you, it means that she is going to learn martial arts, etiquette, and all kinds of chores, right? Yes. I'm planning to train her to be at least an inner maid. Obviously, Tristan didn't like this idea. When Noel saw his expression, he added, that means if Tristan can't complete my tests, she should gain some skills so that she can survive. After all, we have to leave them behind, right? Tristan fell silent after hearing those words. Noel was telling him that even if he failed, they would be able to do something and continue to live on together. Knowing that, he somehow stopped himself from showing an objection. I will do it. Please let me do it. Sandra lowered her head. How is that, Dimitri? I will do my best. Though, I won't be showing any mercy especially since they are already a bit too old for training. I have to pick up the pace. All right. You teach them about that basic stuff. After you're done with Tristan, I'll continue with the lesson about runes. Noel looked at Tristan. Remember this. If you can't even keep up with the training, let alone give you a test, I won't even bother to teach you about runes. I understand. Tristan was aware that he was still a slave even if Noel had burned away everything. Noel was already gracious enough to show enough compassion by promising to teach him the runes. If he somehow managed to become the disciple of the author of the rune book, he would be able to turn his life around. Alright, since we've reached an agreement, I'm going to tell you about the second and third problems. Rune has become a vital point of a great change that will occur in all kingdoms soon. So I, the author, will most likely get targeted, including both of you. I'm going to protect my people but you should be aware that your life will be in danger if you remain beside me. Last but not least, you two have become another variable in my journey. Know that my order considers your safety as well. If you can't follow my order, don't blame me for being a bit merciless. Noel squinted his eyes. Sandra and Tristan felt chills down their spine despite the hotness of the desert. They weren't adept in this matter because they didn't even have a basic education, so they didn't understand what Noel was saying. But it was clear that Noel was serious about it. Then, let's go. Noel stood up and raised his hood. Dimitri took a set of clothes and a coat and put it on Tristan. With the new clothes, hood, and masquerade, 
Tristan shouldn't look like a slave at first glance. Luckily, due to the situation in the desert, if they used high walls to protect their city, the heat would get trapped inside. Hence, there was no city gate or whatsoever. Noel and Tristan could easily enter the city. As they expected, even after the chaos from earlier, the city didn't seem to be affected. Noel asked, guide me to the place you escaped from. Tristan was slightly shocked that Noel wanted to go to that place. He thought Noel wanted to hand him away, which scared him. However, Tristan remembered Noel's words earlier and decided to lead him. Once they reached that place, they saw a crowd surrounding the area. Hmm? Noel frowned. Since he couldn't see it from here, Noel dragged Tristan to an alley. The building in this city had a similar structure. They were using box shapes that stretched upward. But because of it, Noel could easily step on the roof. So, he just grabbed Tristan's waist and used the rune to toss him into the roof. Tristan was surprised that rune could be used this way. But Noel told him to stay here as he walked to the edge of the roof to check what was going on. He saw numerous people lying on the ground. They seemed to have died. But what concerned Noel was the fact that they had similar clothing as Tristan's earlier. It was clear they were slaves. And more and more bodies were dragged from the collapsed building. No one seemed to have survived. Tristan's choice to escape might not be wrong. However, he also noticed that a fat middle-aged man was clutching his head while shouting, No. Why did this happen? I lost all my slaves. Noel frowned. He knew that the middle-aged man was the slave merchant that owned Tristan earlier. But he didn't like how he treated those people like an object even though Dimitri had taught him about this country's slavery system. Unfortunately, Noel could only remain silent in this different ideology. Since nothing important could be gained, Noel returned to Tristan and asked, Do you have anything you want to do to that guy? Tristan shook his head. For him, escaping from the slave merchant was already enough. All right then, let's go around the town to resupply and gather some information. Try to remember the layout of the city, listen to the people's words, and see if there is anything weird. Understood. Chapter 810 Parade Noel and Tristan continued wandering around the city. As a future lord, he gathered information about the town like its economy and politics. Here you go. Noel handed a few coins to the seller while grabbing a huge bag that contained their supply. Of course, Noel had thought about using the honor points to procure water and hunting demons for food, but he was a bit skeptical about the idea. On the one hand, losing some honor points gave a lot of convenience. On the other hand, he didn't want to waste too many honor points, especially with the fact that the two kids were here. He wanted to get accustomed to the fact that they might have no water to drink. He would definitely use his honor points in an emergency though. Due to his policy, he understood the supply problem the kingdom had. According to the locals, the kingdom had a problem with both water supply and food. While their border wasn't as good as the Muvil kingdom so that the demons could roam in their kingdom and become the source of food, it was still hard to hunt one. Drinking water was also a problem because rain only came every now and then, so most of their water supply came from either other cities or underground. Those two necessities were a bit expensive in this area. So, Noel learned how they handled the problem and ran a city. The situation might not apply to the Muvil Kingdom, but if a drought or famine hit his territory, he could use their method to get by. This was the reason why Noel didn't bring a lot of stuff and used his system to his advantage. He wanted to procure everything from this kingdom and ask things while he was at it. After procuring their supplies, Noel looked at Tristan, who was wearing his clothes. Is there something wrong, master? Tristan asked. The master in his mouth was like a slave calling its owner instead of a disciple calling its teacher. Tristan was aware of his position. He hadn't become Noel's disciple, so it was only right for him to address him this way. We still don't have any clothes for you and Sandra. Let's get some and continue the journey. I don't mind if I only need to wear that ragged clothes. Tristan politely rejected, not wanting to burden Noel even further. The living conditions are extreme in the desert. I don't want you to get frozen during the night. If you are sick whatsoever, it will also burden me. So we're going to get some clothes for both of you. Noel continued walking, ignoring his concern. He added, if you want to repay me, you can do it by completing my tests. Tristan raised his eyebrows, surprised. It seemed that Noel had some expectations of him. In order to turn his life around, Tristan swore that he would definitely become Noel's disciple. The two continued to walk to the clothing store. However, they suddenly heard a rumbling sound coming from the side, followed by a lot of cheers. Ugh, Sir Ramirez. It was a bit far away from them, but it seemed that the cheers were moving in their direction. When other people heard about those cheers, they came out of their buildings and tried to find the so-called Ramirez. 
Even the store in front of him suddenly opened its door as a few employees came out to take a sneak peek. Ah? A customer? An employee stopped for a moment, recognizing Noel and Tristan. However, seeing their clothes that didn't seem to be coming from this kingdom, the employee asked, I apologize, sir. Do you mind waiting for a bit? Is there a celebration or something? Noel asked. You must be a tourist. An employee smiled and extended her hand to the side, explaining, the city protector must have come back. I don't know if you are aware of it, but the city protector is the most respected person in this city. He leads his army to hunt a lot of demons to feed the citizens. Thanks to him and the team, we have no food problem. Is that so? Now I'm curious about him. Noel nodded in understanding. Is he coming back every day? No. He usually organizes twice a month. They bring a lot of demons back. If you wait for a bit, you will see a long train of demon corpses. Oh? In that case, I'll wait here and see the process. Will there be a problem if I am from another kingdom? Noel asked. Of course not. There are a lot of tourists and Sir Ramirez doesn't have any problem with foreigners. So, you will be fine. In that case, I'll watch it and enter the store after it's over. Thank you for your understanding, good sir. The employee smiled. It seemed that the parade was a big deal, considering they respected him so much. Even normal customers came out to take a peek at this Ramirez. Curious, Noel stood next to the store with Tristan beside him. He asked in a low voice, Do you know anything? Yes. Each city usually has its own protector. You have to be strong and capable of leading an army to hunt the food. In exchange, you become the most respected person in this city. You will get money from the tax people pay. You get the fame not only in the city you protect but also in another city. And you can easily get any woman you want. Sometimes, they don't mind becoming a concubine. But sometimes, it causes a conflict and strength will overrule everything. I see. Noel squinted his eyes as the cheers were about to reach his place. Noel waited for the so-called Ramirez to appear. Before that person appeared, it seemed that Artigan had managed to capture him first by using the affection medal. Name, Ramirez. Affection, neutral, 0 slash 100. Description, he doesn't know you. After the information, Ramirez finally appeared in the corner of his vision. He looked like a man in his early thirties. He had curly black hair and a robust body. His eyes were sharp but gentle. The one that stood out from him was the sword that he used. The sword curved so much that it was almost a crescent. The handle and the scabbard were coated with gold with a lot of shining gems. He didn't seem to have any armor. His clothes were very loose and thin, exposing a good portion of his body. Noel squinted his eyes, trying to measure his ability. As he expected, this person was only a spirit master. What piqued Noel's interest was the middle-aged man next to him. He looked more reserved and calm, but Noel could see that he was a spirit grandmaster. If Noel had to fight them, he could easily defeat this Ramirez and have a hard time against this old man. Behind them were a lot of charts carrying a mountain of demon corpses. Surprisingly, the ones that pushed the carts were humans. If he looked at their attire, he was sure they were slaves. They all looked exhausted, but nobody paid them any attention. He could understand that these demons could be used to feed the entire city for a while. Noel hardly encountered any demons on his way to this place, so it seemed that this group was the one exterminating them. I wonder if I can use this kind of system too? Well, the soldiers will definitely hunt some demons. But how should I distribute the demon crystals and the meat? Noel frowned and asked Tristan. How do you distribute all those things? There is another building for that. Usually, they share it over a period of time and a person from the family will line up. If they find out that there are two members of one family lining up, then you will be punished. That's for the meat. How about the demon crystals? They are usually distributed to the army. They are the ones keeping the town safe, so it's only right for them to get stronger. Noel contemplated for a moment. The soldiers can probably do that, but I think I should get a portion of the demon crystals for additional funds or another way to reward them. Since I'm near the border, there will be a lot of demons around, which means the meat will be abundant. Should I sell their corpses as well? But bringing all their corpses is going to be a challenge. Unlike this place, we don't have slaves or even terrain. Should I pay people to do the rough job? But will it cover the cost? If it's too long, the meat will rot as well. This is hard. Noel kept encountering a lot of questions as he couldn't help but ask, Is there any way to preserve meat? I mean they're doing it twice a month, right? It means the meat has to last for about two weeks. Yes. They do have a preservation method. But I'm afraid I don't know the method. I see. Where can I find the method? Is it available to the public? I believe there are secret methods to each city and only the protector knows about it. 
It's a kind of liquid that prevents the meat from rotting. Tristan pointed at the corpse. Right now, there is no mixture yet. But once they process it, we usually get meat with some sort of powders. Not only can it preserve the meat longer, but it also tastes better. Noel became more curious about it. He thought about it until the parade was over and the store finally opened again. Chapter 811 Schedule How is it? Noel asked while looking at Tristan. This time, he was wearing the clothing unique to this kingdom. Due to the harsh condition, the clothing was thin but covered the entire body. Only those who didn't mind the tan would expose their skin to the sun. Noel also bought some shawls and clothes for himself. This is good. Tristan nodded with a serious expression. This might be the first time he had clothes this smooth. Even back in his village, he could only wear ragged clothes since they didn't have enough money. Can I really wear these clothes? Yeah. Noel turned to the employee. Can I get two more sets for him along with the same number of women's clothing? Her size is similar to him. Understood. The employee helped him pick the clothes without hesitation. Seeing how Noel didn't mind spending a lot of money for a slave, the employee was planning to pick some good stuff that was more expensive. Despite being that expensive, it only amounted to two gold coins, which Noel could easily pay. While the employee was taking care of the payment, Noel couldn't help but ask, is the parade always held on this street? The employee remembered that Noel had to wait until the parade was over. She nodded no sir, the parade will be held depending on where the group is coming from. So, it can be from the west, east or south. It's been three months since the street was used. I see. No wonder why people are happy. I thought you would be a bit bored after seeing it multiple times. Noel nodded in understanding. Ha ha. We won't ever get tired of it. The parade is not only to celebrate and thank the protector, but also for the occasion of praying for the next harvest. How do you become a protector? Noel asked another question. While wrapping the clothes, the employee answered, Unfortunately, I am not aware of the answer. Though I've heard that you can either rise from the bottom or become the previous protector's successor. Noel remembered the old man who happened to be a spirit grandmaster. Was the previous protector among those people from earlier? I believe I saw a strong middle-aged man. Yes, sir. It's surprising that you noticed it despite being a foreigner. Sir Rishian was the previous protector and decided to take a successor, Sir Ramirez, three years ago. I see. Noel saw what the employee had done, so he grabbed the bag filled with clothes and said, Thank you. Thank you very much for your patronage. I hope you enjoy your visit to this country. The employee politely bowed to him. Noel waved his hand, signaling Tristan to follow him. He got some crucial information and new thoughts about his future territory. It seemed that he wasn't wrong in visiting another kingdom. Due to the difference in culture, they had different ways of ruling. While a lot of them couldn't be applied to the Mewville kingdom, he still learned some of them, which could be useful in the future. After buying a few other necessities, Noel and Tristan finally returned to Dimitri. Surprisingly, they already saw Dimitri teaching Sandra. Dimitri, you already began? Noel frowned. He thought about letting Sandra recover fully first before teaching her. This way, it would be more effective. However, Dimitri said I'm sorry master. The girl asked me to start right away since she didn't want to be left behind. So if we are alone, I will teach her about etiquette and all kinds of work related to a maid. When both of them come, I'll begin teaching basic martial arts, how to read and write, and some stuff about spirit. It seems that you've gotten a good grasp on the schedule. For now, you can teach them how to read and write in the morning. I will take some time to teach him about runes during the day. And during the night, you teach them about the rest. Understood. Dimitri agreed with the schedule Noel put. Noel considered how good Tristan's memory was in this decision. He believed that Tristan could grasp the runes sooner or later. So, he wanted to focus on his spiritual energy and spirit as the foundation of his runes. Thank you very much. Tristan knelt in front of him and thanked Noel. This was the first time he was treated this well, especially by the people who thought about his future. Seeing Tristan's gratitude, Sandra also knelt in front of Noel to thank him. No matter how much you're going to thank me, it's going to be useless if you can't pass the tests. So, you can save them later. Noel waved his hand as if treating it as not a big deal. Of course, before becoming Noel's disciple, Noel didn't plan to elevate their status from slave to commoner. Though, he would treat them like a proper human being. Yes. Alright. Help us pack up the luggage. I have bought some food for us to eat before leaving this place. The two happily followed Dimitri. After distributing the bags and filling up their bellies, they continued their journey to the next city. During the journey, Noel taught Tristan about runes, measuring his talent. 
The rune system consists of strokes that follow the natural flow of spiritual energy. Depending on the depth of the stroke, the size of the line, their shape, and other things, the flow will become different. Noel then formed three strength blessing runes in front of Tristan and asked, What do you see from these three? Hmm. Tristan furrowed his eyebrows, having a hard time. At first glance, all of them looked the same. But if he inspected them carefully, there were a few different lines scattered among the strength blessing runes. I think there are a few differences from what I can see. Tristan was a bit unsure and began to point out the difference. Like this one. The one he mentioned had a different curve, which was easily distinguishable. However, Tristan had a hard time finding the details among them. This was the difference between Rose and Tristan. Tristan had a good memory, which was useful for the memorization of the runes. With this, he could cram a lot of knowledge in his brain and began experimenting after learning a lot. On the other hand, Rose had a pair of eyes that could find all those differences due to her exceptional five senses. However, she would have a problem making a breakthrough in the future. That was why Tristan was more suitable to be Noel's disciple. It appeared that he had to train Tristan's eyes. While it might not be as good as Rose, with an increase in perception, Tristan should become good quickly. After hearing Tristan's answer, Noel asked, In that case, which one will succeed? I think this one. I can't find a lot of fault in this one. Tristan pointed at the right one. Noel began pouring his spiritual energy into the three runes. Unfortunately, each rune actually failed and faded away. That's, Tristan looked down, thinking he had made a grave mistake. This is the difference between normal methods and the runes. If you want to use a rune, you are unable to create even a single mistake, or it will cause a problem. The disruption in the spiritual energy because of that error will affect the entire rune and cause it to fail. That's why your memorization is suitable for this. Noel ended it with encouragement, showing the reason he chose him. Of course, you will face a lot of problems. You can create runes like this. But if you don't have good control over your strokes, causing the line to be bigger, smaller, or have some changes, it won't get activated as well. Hence, I'll be training you about all basics first before moving to the runes. But during that time, I also want you to memorize the runes, their strokes, their size, their pattern, everything. Understood, master. I'll do my best. Tristan was determined. There was a reason why Noel chose him. He didn't plan to waste this chance and disappoint Noel. His family had sold him as a slave, so he didn't really have any attachment to this kingdom. Everything he wanted was just to follow Noel and turn his life around. With that determination, Noel began teaching him about all the basics. If they were resting, Noel would ask Tristan to use sand or paper to draw the runes. If they were walking, Noel would provide him with some verbal lessons. During the morning, Tristan and Sandra learned from Dimitri. Reading and writing were extremely important if they wanted to be a part of the Ardigan family. As for the night, Dimitri showed no mercy on them and pushed them to their physical ability to the limit. After they slept, Noel used his force control to stimulate the natural recovery so that their muscles could repair themselves at a quick speed and be ready to face the next day's training. Even though Tristan and Sandra felt like they had been pushed to the limit as though they were forced to mine until they dropped dead, they didn't have any bad thoughts about Noel and Dimitri. They could feel the care from them. While it didn't provide any apparent result physically, they still got some results mentally. Finally, a week passed by. They finally reached their next destination, where Noel got a mission from Ardigan, the Recoral City. He was planning to get an item that could help Heisk. At the same time, he wondered how a desert like this would have an ice element item. Title Walker of the Worlds, 1789-1795, to by Grand underscore Void underscore Dost. Chapter 1789, Fury Main Twister, Arg. Chan Fe cried in pain and covered his waist while blood continued to pour out. Unlike the other wounds he couldn't directly sew them shut using his hair thus. The bleeding was intense. How's that Chan Fe? The suffering is just beginning. Mio Ran mocked. Even if you are a body cultivator, that is nothing compared to my agate scale drake claws. Lin Mu who heard the name, narrowed his eyes. Agate scale drake? He somewhat felt like he had read about it before. He quickly took out the jade slip that had all the information compiled in it and checked it, quickly finding more about it. Hmm, so it's similar to the flame pool drake bloodline that King Hong obtained back then. It wasn't Lin Mu's first time hearing about a drake bloodline and knew that it was descended from dragons. But in the current case, the agate scale drake was a rather unique kind of a drake. This drake actually evolved from the common earthen lizards due to their regular consumption of minerals and ores. A few of the lucky earthen lizards might improve their bloodline during a breakthrough, 
and transform into agate scale drakes. Just like their names, agate scale drakes had scales that had agate-like patterns and similar sharpness. They could tear through steel and bronze alike, making it easy for them to consume it all. A cultivator that had the bloodline of an agate scale drake also obtained its characteristics. For example, like what Mio Ran was doing, they could transform a part of their body and obtain strong claws. The bloodline also gave Mio Ran a tougher body, which could now compare to that of a body cultivator like Chang Fa. Of course, there might be limitations to it, but right now, it was clear that Chang Fa was greatly outmatched. This would be tough. Lin Mu wondered if the interference with Nine Divine Heart Sutras would even work or not. Observing the fight for a bit, Lin Mu was sure that it wouldn't work if he used the Nine Divine Heart Sutras just on Mio Ran. He would also have to use it on Chang Fei himself. I need to suppress Mio Ran and support Chang Fei at the same time, Lin Mu was sure of it. With that in mind, Lin Mu first decided to help Chang Fei calm down. Having sustained multiple injuries as well as continuing the fight, the man's mind was under great strain. As such, if he continued there was a high chance he would lose focus and end up getting injured further. If that happened, his defeat would be imminent. Hum, Chan Yefei, who was in the middle of dodging a claw attack from Mio Ran, suddenly felt like the stress filling him was fading away. Replacing it was a sense of calmness that he hadn't felt for a long time now. All the conflicts he had in his mind were gone, and even the pain was becoming manageable. What is this? Chang Fei had no idea what was happening to him. Is this some sort of phenomenon? He wondered. He knew that others could feel a rush of adrenaline during an intense fight, and could make one feel similar to this. But this was different than that. Unlike an adrenaline rush where one's mind was running at a thousand paces and one's heart kept on throbbing like crazy, Chang Fei felt a sense of tranquility instead. Instead of his thinking improving due to the sheer speed, it now felt like he had no obstacles in his thoughts allowing him to process everything better than before. Chan Yefei gazed at Mio Ran, watching his every movement, his mocking expression, the power of his claws as well as the immortal chi fluctuations that rose from him. He's playing with me. Chan Yefei understood. Whoosh. Chan Yefei narrowly dodged another attack, while also using the hair wrapped around his torso like a whip to snap back. I see now. I just need to turn his arrogance against him. Chan Yefei realized. He realized that his opponent had already assumed that victory was his. Chan Fei wished to take advantage of this very misjudgment. And as if fates were willing to grant him this favor, he found that his opponent had actually gotten sloppy. Ha! Chan Fei, be ripped under my claws. Mio Ran's expression turned fiercer, and he attacked with an even greater power. But unlike before, his attacks seemed to be lacking the accuracy that they had before. This combined with Chan Fei's improved focus meant that he could already predict where Mio Ran intended to strike. I see now. I see it all. Chang Yafei muttered as he thinned the hair that was covering his body in the form of an armor. Instead of letting it focus on defense, Chang Yafei let them gather around his arms before he brought them together. I'll end it with one last attack. I'll give it my all. Chang Yafei decided. He observed Mio Ran who was attacking haphazardly and picked the right moment to counterattack. Iron Pillar Main Arts. Fourth Art. Fury main twister, Chang Fei roared. His hair arms that he had brought together suddenly enlarged, turning into two spirals that entwined and shot forward. Mio Ran who was in the middle of an attack, was caught between the two spirals, the hair suddenly wrapping around him. His limbs were locked in the hair, while his sharp claws were balled up into a fist by the hair. Even his face was covered by the hair, making him unable to see or speak anything. Ah ha! Chang Fei used up all of his energy in the last attack turning it into raw, twisting power. Crack, kacha, crunch. Then with a sickening crunch, Mio Rant's limbs were twisted, his bones shattering in the process. But that wasn't all, as Chang Fei's hair was not stopping its momentum. After having twisted the man's limbs, it now threatened to twist the man's waist and neck. Chapter 1790, Chang Fei's Final Gambit It was clear that Chang Fei had reached a point where he couldn't hold back even if he wanted to. His attack had already been executed and if it continued, Mio Rant's life would quite likely be ended. After all, while an immortal could survive a broken spine, they wouldn't be able to do the same with their neck. Only their nascent soul would survive this, but that would still be a grave setback for the immortal. Finding a suitable body might not be difficult for someone on the level of Mio Ran, but it would certainly come at a cost. Kacha, and just as was feared, the man's waist was the first to be broken. His torso was turned around 
his chest facing in the direction of his heels. But as if one turn was not enough, Chang Fei's hair was now turning Neo Rant's neck back. If it succeeded, the man's chest would face the back, but his head would still face forward. It was a terrifying thought. Crack. Mio Rant's neck was turned around 120 degrees when cracking sounds were already heard. But just as it was about to progress any further, a sudden force descended upon both Chang Afei and Mio Ran. Chang Afei's hair suddenly stopped moving while Mio Ran's body turned into a flash of light. Whoosh. With Mio Ran no longer in the grip of Chang Afei's hair, the two thick strands clapped together, creating a loud snapping sound. Snap. And a moment later, Chang Afei's body also turned into a flash of light before being teleported out of the spatial plane. SHUA. Mio Ran has been defeated. Chang Afei is the winner. The announcement was heard after a slight pause, confirming the win of the Iron Pillar main arts inheritor. The win did not result in the cacophony of cheers though. It was strange since most of the people in the audience would burst out and shout in excitement. Instead, all of them were looking at the formation screen with a look of shock. Some even had a hint of terror mixed into their expressions, possibly imagining what would happen if they were in the position of Mio Ran. Still, as if this wasn't enough, the next set of events further made them scared. Quick healers! The elder watching over the platform shouted. Whoosh whoosh whoosh. A team of healers from the temple quickly arrived and checked up on Mio Ran, who was lying on the ground. Now that there was no hair covering him, his actual condition could be seen clearly. His limbs had been twisted and looked gnarly, while his flesh was ripped in the process. Fragments of bones poked out from the man's joints while copious amounts of blood leaked out of it. The worst wasn't even his limbs though, it was his torso. The man had been twisted from his waist, causing his spine to be severed. But the twisting motion had also torn the skin around his stomach and flank apart, revealing his internals. He's in a grave condition. His internal organs are all damaged. His governing meridian has been severed. Bring the head healer. We can't do this on our own. But when the healers checked him, they realized that the condition was a lot worse than they had thought. Not only had Mio Ran suffered damage to his externals, even his internal along with an important meridian had been broken. With such a condition, even using healing pills would be ineffective. One would need direct treatment from a great healer with their techniques to survive something like this. Ack, ack, ack. What was worse though, was the fact that Mio Ran seemed to still be conscious to some level. Though he was unable to articulate his words as he kept on vomiting blood. Bits of crushed organs could be seen in the bloody vomit, showing the extent of the damage. This, this is the worst injury so far. A few people in the audience spoke. Even if there had been many fights and deadly attacks had been used in them, the contestants had still survived them in much better condition than this. And it was all due to the safety mechanisms of the spatial planes array preventing them from dying. It would teleport them out when it felt them being knocked out or when it detected their vitality had suddenly fallen. But perhaps it was due to the fact that Chang Fei's attack was a physical one and had come in a different way than most. The array hadn't registered it quickly enough. And by the time it did, Mio Ran had already sustained grave injuries. Hom, the head healer was already present nearby and arrived at a moment's notice. His immortal sense checked Mio Ran and quickly prepared for a healing procedure. He brought his palms together before placing them on Mio Ran's body. A green glow covered the man's body, stopping his bleeding for the time being. Take us to the healing pavilion. I can only stabilize him for now. We'll need to do an intense healing session, the head healer said. Yes, elder. The other healers said as they prepared to move, they threw out a white sheet of cloth that expanded to a size of 5 meters. The head healer transferred Mio Ran onto the cloth while the other healers also stood on it. Whoosh. Then in the next moment, they flew away to the healing pavilion. Chang Fei didn't get to see much though, as he was lying on his back and facing the sky. He was in pain too and was bleeding. Fortunately, a couple of healers had already approached him and fed him a pill. They carried him away as well leaving the overseeing elder with a frown. What had just happened was possibly a grave oversight on their side. Chang Fei's attack might be too much, but the arrays should have still worked in time. The elder knew that Chang Fei had no blame for this. Chapter 1791 Gaining Face for the Iron Pillar Main Clan The overseeing elder knew that Chang Fei was the weaker party in this fight and had only done what was asked of them, giving their all in a fight. If anything, Chang Fei would have been the loser if Mio Ran had struck him a few more times. Everyone had seen that Mio Ran had the upper hand in the fight. As soon as he had used his bloodline of the Agate Scale Drake, it had only become a one-sided fight. What Chang Fei had done was just a last-ditch effort to fight. And this time around, 
It had worked albeit at the cost of great injuries to his opponent. The audience knew the situation was concerning and didn't shout like before. Instead, they were all discussing in hushed voices. They were talking about the same thing, Chang Fei and the skill he had demonstrated at the end. This Chang Fei did something unbelievable. I know right, he actually injured Mio Ran who had the bloodline of an agate scale drake. That should have made his body really tough, and yet Chang Fei's hair was able to twist his tough limbs and body apart. Chang Fei was truly bloodthirsty this time. I wouldn't say that exactly. If anything, he did what was expected of him. Indeed. Could you ever think of holding back against a strong opponent that was close to killing you? No. I would use all my trump cards to survive. Exactly. It just so happens that Chang Fei's trump card was too strong. Though his technique, the Iron Pillar main art seems to be stronger than I thought. Yeah, at first I thought they were just some eccentric techniques. Who knew they would be this strong? To literally twist and rip apart an immortal with a drake's bloodline like that. His clan is really low-key. Looks like we'll have to look into Iron Pillar main clan. Unknown to Chang Fei, he had managed to accomplish what he had come here for, to raise the reputation of his clan. And with a little assistance from Lin Mu, not only had he done that but also managed to earn himself a fearsome reputation. Over a million immortals had been watching the fight since it was the only match of the cycle left. Each and every one of them had seen Chang Fei twist apart Mio Ran. The mere memory of it caused goosebumps to spread on the backs and necks of the weak-hearted. After all, even among the immortals, there were many that hadn't really seen gory injuries before. Even if they had faced death and killed others, it was often clean and honorable fights. The injuries from them might be deadly, but didn't have effects like this. What terrified them, even more, was the fact that rather than dying, Mio Ran had survived it. He would now have to bear all the pain and suffering from his injuries. And from what the healers spoke, the people knew that it didn't really bid well for Mio Ran. Deep down they knew that while Mio Ran might survive this, he might not be in a good condition after it. Everyone heard that Mio Ran's governing meridian was severed. It was an injury that no cultivator wished to suffer as it would mean that their ability to use Chi would basically be reduced by over 50%. The governing meridian was very important, as it connected to several other meridians that spread around the body. It was also this meridian that directly connected to the Dantian, carrying the Chi through it. With it broken, the flow of qi would be highly obstructed. Restoring the governing meridian was possible, but the long-term injuries sustained from it would continue to linger. Even if it was repaired, there was no guarantee Mio Ran would be able to use his immortal qi to the same level as before. He would have to resort to rare and expensive healing medicines to fix this. His limbs were the least of his injuries. After all regrowing limbs was still possible, and in the case of Mio Ran, they weren't even severed. A mid-quality flesh restoration pill and bone mending pill would return them to their natural condition. But the rest of the man's injuries were too hard to fix. The temple of the four guardian beasts had all the means to do it of course. But the question whether they would fully do it was an interesting one. Lin Mu and his companions who watched it all happen were stunned too. I was indeed not mistaken. Chan Fei's strength and potential are good. Lin Mu finally spoke after having watched it all. Was that? You're doing brother Mu Lin? Ming Danden and Ming Aoyan contacted Lin Mu. I did assist Chang Fei, but it had nothing to do with his final attack. That was all Chang Fei's own strength, Lin Mu replied. Hearing that, Luo Li Qin and Lu Su couldn't help but rethink the eccentric man's image in their minds. Still, would this be fine for Chang Fei? Ming Danden couldn't help but ask. He hasn't broken any rules, so he should be totally fine, Luo Li Qin answered. But aren't Neo Rant's injuries a little too severe? Ming Aolian asked next, the power behind him might take offense to this too, that's useless. The moment one decides to participate in the tournament of the four guardian beasts, one knows what they could potentially be facing. We all have done the same, Lu Su replied. If Neil Rant's clan takes offense to it, they wouldn't be able to blame Chang Fei. Rather than him, the actual target of the blame would have to be the temple who failed in teleporting Neil Ran before it reached this level, he explained. Regardless of what the consequences might be, Chang Fei and his clan's name would now be known all across the continent, and even beyond it. Luo Li Qin stated, Powers from all over the world have witnessed this. Fear is a lot stronger in spreading one's reputation than valor after all. He has earned face for his clan. Chapter 1792, Win in the Blink of an Eye With the second cycle of fights over, Lin Mu and his companions gathered once more to discuss as well as to rest. They had earned quite a lot in this round especially due to the reversal in Chang Fei's fight. 
Lin Mu had gotten Luo Liqing to bet on Chang Fa, and since the odds were supposed to favor Miao Ran, the return had been nearly ten times the amount that they had bet. We'll have to wait till the participants of the next cycle are decided, Brother Mu Lin. Luo Liqing spoke. That is true. Lin Mu nodded his head. With the rise in their funds again, they discussed what would be the best way to use them again. Till then though, I suppose we can prepare for the other fights. There's still Lu Su and Ming Aolian left to fight, Luo Liqing added. Yes, you should do that. Brother Mu Lin's tactics were very helpful for me. Ming Dandan chimed in. I don't think I would have been able to last otherwise. She added. I'm pleased that it was helpful. I guess we can do a more broad lesson this time. To cover all possible foes. Lin Mu replied. Since they didn't know who would be participating next, it was a lot better to just do an overall study. They had done this before too. But now that the targets had narrowed down, Lin Mu could be a lot more specific. And while they did this, the Temple of the Four Guardian Beasts was also busy at work. They had a lot of things to deal with now. From the injury of Mio Ran to the flaw in the array that had left him in that state. The clan behind Mio Ran had already sent an official inquiry to the temple asking for an explanation. This was completely valid on their part, and the temple was obliged to answer as well. His clan knew that they couldn't really complain about Mio Ran's injury. But they could very well ask about a flaw in the temple's arrays. After the Mio clan's inquiry was sent, a few other powers also expressed their concerns with their arrays. After all, now that people knew there was a flaw, there were bound to be some people that might attempt to exploit the flaw. They didn't wish for their people to get affected by this. Thus they also asked the temple to take care of this. As such, the people of the temple were busy getting solutions for it while their formation masters were already working on the array. Considering all this, the temple sent out a notice that the next cycle of four matches would be delayed for at least a day. For some, this was the last bit of time they could squeeze in for training, while for some it was just a delay in progress. Regardless of what they felt, the day passed quickly and the temple quickly sent out a new notice telling everyone that the flaw had been rectified. The identity tokens of all participants signaled them about the next cycle of matches. Lin Mu and his companions also saw them finding a few familiar faces among them. Seems like we can sit this cycle out. Lu Su said seeing that the four matches didn't include him or Ming Aolian. Let's see. Lin Mu looked at the list of participants for the next cycle. Other than a few minor contestants that Lin Mu had seen in the earlier fights, there was a big name. Dugushanha. Now that's a fight that I certainly want to watch. Lin Mu spoke. The man's skills were an enigma even now, and no one had been able to figure them out. His earlier fights had all ended very fast, with some ending in the blink of an eye, thus it left many people confused. Even Lin Mu was at a loss as he was unable to understand what his technique was from what he had heard so far. This is a good chance to make higher earning bets. Luo Liqin could already see the betting pavilion sending out information about the odds through the plate. Other than Dugushanha, the other three fights are all similarly matched. It will give you a good chance to manipulate it, he explained. And MMM will do it, Lin Mu replied. The matches weren't that far, being only six hours from now. Thus Lin Mu and the rest quickly got to work. Luo Liqin set some initial bets, excluding Dugushanha's fight, as he knew that it was basically decided already. Even the betting pavilion knew that, and had set the odds accordingly. Betting on Dugushanha would simply net the person nothing. With only three matches to focus on, Lin Mu and Luo Liqin would have an easier time. Qian Wen also returned during this time, albeit still not fully healed. Though he assured that it wouldn't take him more than a couple more days to recover. Time passed and eventually, it was time for the fights. Everyone was watching the formation screens intently as the contestants were all teleported into the spatial planes. Lin Mu was only watching on person though and even had his immortal sense present in the arrays, tunneling towards a particular spatial plane. He was watching none other than Dugushanha as he wished to know more about his skill. SHUA Dugushanha and his opponent arrived in the spatial plane, standing 200 meters from each other. Dugushanha you will. The man's opponent tried to speak, but suddenly stopped. His expression became still, while his eyes went blank. Then a moment later something astonishing happened. Thud. SHUA. The man collapsed on the gourd, before being teleported away. What was that? Ming Dandan said in surprise. He just fell like that. Lin Mu who had been watching it, furrowed his brows though. The way Dugushanha's opponent was defeated felt familiar to him. After all, several of Lin Mu's opponents had been defeated in the same way before. It almost seems like the sutras. Lin Mu thought. Chapter 1793 
rising fortune and a stack of letters. The swift defeat of Dugashanha's opponent was concerning to Lin Mu. Seems like I'll have to consult someone who has faced Dugashanha before. Lin Mu thought. He knew that fighting Dugashanha would be inevitable in the tournament. Lin Mu didn't think that anyone would be able to defeat him other than perhaps the third prince, or Yao Changing. The chances of Dugashanha facing them were the same as him facing Lin Mu. Thus Lin Mu reckoned it was best to be prepared. Child Wildfire. Guess I gotta talk to him. He was the only one that had fought Dugashanha before and was directly acquainted with Lin Mu. Also unlike the others that toppled quickly, he was said to have stood his ground for a bit longer. He might know more too. He hoped. With that in mind, Lin Mu decided to talk to the man when the current cycle of matches was over. Lin Mu used his sutras to influence the fights like before and earned himself a decent sum from the bets. We're steadily improving our bets. I think if we keep this up, by the fifth cycle we would be able to bet nearly 100,000 high-grade immortal stones. Luo Li Qin estimated. That much? Ming Yan's eyes went wide. We might make even more. It all comes down to what matches happen. Luo Li Qin explained. I guess we won't have to worry about immortal stones for quite a few years after this. Ha ha. Lu Su was as happy as a daisy in spring. And this is just for the current stage of the tournament. I can't even imagine how much we would have by semi-finals. Luo Li Qin said with excrement. They had thought that semi-finals would possibly be the last stage when they would be able to continue their safe bets. After that, it was quite likely for them to simply not be in the matches other than Lin Mu. Of course, there was always a chance a bet could go wrong and they could lose a significant portion of their wealth. This was also the reason why Lin Mu hadn't gotten them to bet the full amount all at once. While the returns from that would be massive, Lin Mu didn't wish to take the risk. Plus there was a higher chance for the betting pavilion to find it strange too. The number of people who would be able to bet a million high-grade immortal stones was not many. The majority were either nobles or were from great powers. It would get them scrutinized and perhaps even investigated later. And if it was found that they were winning basically all bets since they had started, it would be a clear warning sign for them. If anything, they would be highly invested in finding the manipulator. Even if they knew the chances of it were less, it would possibly earn them something from it due to the temple's interest in diviners as well. The one thing Lin Mu was thankful for though, was the fact that there were only a couple of people from Blackfin Island left in the tournament. Most of them had been wiped out in the earlier stage and only the strongest among them were left. Still, the fact that they could survive till this point was a testament to the strength of the Blackfin Island's members. It showed their capability as warriors and assassins. Since this cycle's matches had all ended within an hour, there was a lot of time left till the next match. Lin Mu reckoned it was the best time to meet Child Wildfire. Hopefully he'll know more. Lin Mu thought and contacted the man using the communication jade slip. Lin Mu had to wait five minutes before he received a very short response. It only mentioned the location where Child Wildfire was waiting at. It's actually there? Seeing the name though, Lin Mu was surprised before looking at his companions. I'll head out for a bit. Lin Mu suddenly soon up. Where are you going, brother Mu Lin? Lu Su asked. I'll go meet Child Wildfire. Lin Mu replied. Him? Why? Ming Aoyan was surprised. I need to talk to him about Dugushanha. His cultivation technique and skills, they need to be investigated as well. We barely have any information about it. Lin Mu answered. That's true. So far no one has understood what Dugushanha does. Some have guessed it to be an illusory technique of some kind. But I guess the one who faced him might have more insights. Lu Su responded. Indeed. I'll see you all later. Lin Mu said before taking his leave. The place that Lin Mu was heading to was none other than the Lingering Bamboo Pavilion. Child Wildfire was actually staying in one of the courtyards in the Lingering Bamboo Pavilion. Though he was some distance from Lin Mu's own courtyard, the Hundred Fruits Courtyard. Upon entering through the large entrance gate of the Lingering Bamboo Pavilion though, Lin Mu met the woman who was the overseer and had talked with him before. Daoist Mu Lin, the woman cupped her hands. Congratulations on your wins, she said respectfully. You've been watching? Lin Mu raised his brows. Of course. How can I miss something like that? She said with a smile. In fact, it isn't just me. Several people have been paying attention to you as well. She added. Oh? Lin Mu knew that there were nobles looking into him. But hearing from the overseer was different. They've actually sent several letters too. The overseer said. Hmm. I thought they wouldn't contact me after learning about the crown prince sponsoring me. Lin Mu stated. Hearing from Lin Mu's own mouth that he was being sponsored by Feng Shun, the overseer's lips curled. She had heard several rumors about it, but now all of them were verified. That's true. 
but the letters that they've sent are all letters of congratulations, she replied. Can you show them to me? Lin Mu asked. Of course, the overseer said before withdrawing a stack of letters from her spatial storage treasure. Chapter 1794 Child's Wildfire's Insights Lin Mu could see at least 30 letters in the stack with some of them being particularly thick. Here's all of them. I've been waiting for you to return to hand them to you. I would have gone to your courtyard, but followed your earlier order of not disturbing it unless you called. She stated. That's right. Lin Mu nodded his head and took the letters. He casually scanned them using his immortal sense and confirmed that the overseer was correct. Though there were also a few letters that were inviting Lin Mu to visit some nobles. The overseer watched him do this and somewhat guessed what might be going through his mind. If you wish, I can deny all future letters. She spoke. No, it's fine. Lin Mu shook his head. You can just collect them. I'll come get them later myself. He ordered. As you wish. The overseer said with a smile before taking her leave. Lin Mu continued onwards to the courtyard where Child Wildfire was staying at. It took him ten minutes to reach him since the man had picked a rather distant courtyard as well. Warming Summer Courtyard Lin Mu read the name, and then looked at the courtyard that was designed in the colors of summer. Creek The gate of the courtyard opened automatically, having sensed the guest. Come in. It was clear that Child Wildfire knew it was Lin Mu waiting outside. Entering through the gate, Lin Mu saw the interior of the courtyard that was smaller than his own. Unlike the large fruit garden that was present in the Hundred Fruits Pavilion, the warming summery courtyard was filled with simple green trees. The main building had a dark red color and was made from bricks, while a few smaller buildings were attached to it as well. Though in the middle of the courtyard, there was a crescent-shaped lake. The crescent-shaped lake circled around a wooden gazebo inside of which sat child wildfire. The man was sitting in a meditative pose and immortal chi was swirling above him. A single look was all it took Lin Mu to understand what was going on. If it's not a good time, I can come later, Lin Mu said right away. It's fine, Child Wildfire replied lightly. My cultivation base is fully stabilized. I just need to absorb the remnants of the immortal chi. That's good. Guess you're the strongest in the tournament now, in terms of chi cultivation base. Lin Mu congratulated the man. Lin Mu's immortal sense could tell that Child Wildfire had already reached the sixth tribulation stage of the immortal realm. But that wasn't all he felt. There was also a faint layer of Tao traces covering Child Wildfire. Though these were almost gone. His Tao skills have probably progressed a lot. Lin Mu thought. What did you want to ask? Child Wildfire opened his eyes, the vortex of immortal chi above him fading away. Hmm, Dugashanha. Lin Mu directly stated, making the man narrow his eyes. I wish to know more about him. If you wanted to know that, it would have been much better for you to go to the brokers who gather intelligence about the contestants. Child Wildfire replied, I've already taken a look. They don't know much. Lin Mu replied as Luo Lichin had already checked that a while ago. Then what do you want to know? Child Wildfire questioned. You fought with him before, right? I wanted to know just how did you lose? Lin Mu answered. So far, all his battles have ended within a minute or less. His opponents simply collapse. He added, MMM. So you thought you would be facing him and wanted to question me. Child Wildfire understood. Exactly. Lin Mu agreed. If so, then you are at a loss. Child Wildfire said much to his surprise. Even I don't know what he does. Huh. How's that possible? Lin Mu was confused. Did you not feel anything when fighting him? No. When I fought him, all I remember is my senses fading away. After that, I woke up to find myself lying on the ground. Child Wildfire explained. Hearing it, Lin Mu was certainly disappointed. Even you don't know how it all went? Lin Mu furrowed his brows. No, if I did, I wouldn't have been in a rush to break through. Child Wildfire replied. Whatever his skill is, it can disable a cultivator quickly. I don't know how to defend against it other than having a stronger cultivation base. He added. Hmm, that's correct. Lin Mu could understand the man's concerns. Though, do you have any guesses as to what it could be? He hoped that Child Wildfire's experience might come in handy here. My best guess is that it is a very strong hypnotic skill, Child Wildfire said. And it should also be heavy in immortal chi consumption. He added, Why do you say that? Lin Mu asked, feeling curious. In the previous stage, Dugishanha didn't use that skill of his regularly. He only used it on stronger opponents that were at the fourth tribulation stage of the immortal realm or above. For the ones weaker than that, he fought them directly. Child Wildfire explained. If his skill had lower consumption, he would have used it regularly. I seem to have missed that. 
Lin Mu was pleased that he at least got something out of the visit. According to my estimation, he shouldn't be able to use it more than ten times if he's facing a fourth tribulation stage immortal, and two times if he's facing a fifth tribulation stage immortal. Child Wildlife continued, At least this is what I've come up with after seeing his uses during the previous stage. There is still a chance he can use it several times more than that. I'll keep that in mind. Lin Mu nodded his head. No wonder he wished to reach the sixth tribulation stage of the immortal realm. There's a chance that he might be able to resist the skill if he's stronger than Dugushana. He thought. Chapter 1795, Dugushana's Mysteries. Talking to Child Wildfire provided Lin Mu with a few insights and gave him a better idea on how to deal with the issue of Dugushana's skill. Considering the fact that Dugushanha cannot use his skills several times in a row as well as on those that are stronger than him, Child Wildfire might just be able to overcome this. Lin Mu thought to himself, I won't disturb you any longer then. You can continue to cultivate. Lin Mu bid the man farewell. Hmm. Child Wildfire simply hummed in response and closed his eyes. It was clear that he still wished to accumulate as much immortal chi as he could before the fight. Him having reached the sixth tribulation stage of the immortal realm was just the start. Lin Mu compared Child Wildfire to the other immortals of a similar level that he had faced so far and realized that he was not at their level yet. The Steel Horn General Nyojo was also said to be at the sixth tribulation stage of the immortal realm in terms of chi cultivation. But having met the man in person, Lin Mu knew just that was not enough. His body cultivation was unknown combined with his chi cultivation, possibly made it a lot stronger. Then there was the beast that Lin Mu had passed by while sailing the seas along with Haima tribe. It was also at the sixth tribulation stage of the immortal realm, but its power was overwhelming. A tornado surrounded it at all times, created by its mere presence. And then there was Crown Prince Feng Shun. Lin Mu didn't know how to exactly judge the man. His behavior and power were both obscure. But considering the fact that he had slain a tyrant bull, even if it were a juvenile was a testament to his power. It only made Lin Mu realize that he had a lot to cover even now. Sigh, I have so much time, and yet I feel lacking. Lin Mu couldn't help but mutter. It was a strange feeling he could not fully comprehend. He knew that others had spent a long time reaching this stage. Even the geniuses had cultivated for a few hundred years to over a thousand years to reach their current strength. While Lin Mu hadn't reached their level, cultivation base-wise, he was still racing towards it. Is it my own desire that makes me wish for it? Or is it the circumstances that are directing me towards it? Lin Mu wondered. Hum. And as Lin Mu was walking back, he felt the token vibrate lightly. New matches are decided? Lin Mu took a look. The ones who were up this time were all unfamiliar to Lin Mu and none of his companions were in it. Guess this will be more relaxed. Lin Mu muttered. Though there is one interesting match to observe. Among the four matches, there was one contestant that was also a top contender. This was none other than Su Zian the one supposed to be fourth ranked among the top five. Soon, Lin Mu was back at the Spring Valley restaurant, where his companions were waiting for him. Welcome back, Lu Su greeted him. Oh? You guys ordered food? Lin Mu saw a few snacks on the table. It was the countess that sent them over. Luo Li Qin responded. She seemed disappointed that you weren't here. Lu Su added with a slight grin. I see. I'll give her my thanks later. Lin Mu calmly said before sitting down. Did you learn something from Child Wildfire? Qian Wen questioned. Yes. Lin Mu answered before narrating what he had talked for Bo. A hypnotic skill. Those are not as rare, but one that can work on those at the fifth tribulation stage immortals are certainly hard to find. Luo Li Qin muttered. Sister, doesn't Butterfly Peak Master also do something like that? Ming Dandan interjected. He does, but his skill is a lot different. Ming Aoyan spoke, catching Lin Mu's interest. Can you tell me more? Lin Mu asked. Sure. The mystifying butterfly dance is a supportive combat skill and is not one that can be cast directly like what Dugushanha does. To use it one actually needs to dance to activate the skill. Though the biggest factor is that the peak master of butterfly peak is at the sixth tribulation stage of the immortal realm too, but can only affect those up to the fourth tribulation stage. Ming Aoyan explained. Huh, peak master is weaker than Dugushanha? Ming Dandan seemed surprised. Isn't he on the same level as our master? He is but his skills do not match up. Ming Aolian shook her head. Dugu Shanha is actually stronger than a peak master of the Blue Mountain Palace. That's unexpected. Lu Su seemed surprised too. Whoever his master is, they might be stronger than the patriarch of the Blue Mountain Palace. Ming Aolian said after thinking for a bit. You really think so? Ming Dandan said in shock. 
If it is a reclusive expert, it does make sense, Qianwen replied. Those experts focus on their own strength unlike the Blue Mountain Palace that nurtures its people, he added. Lin Mu heard their words and wondered if Duge Shanha was similar to Tian Ning. If he also has a celestial as a master, it would all make sense. Lin Mu thought. On another note, Su Zian is fighting in the next cycle. Qian Wen spoke. He's said to be rather good at the battle arts of the army. Ah uh, yes. He's a rather popular candidate too and has a lot of achievements. Lu Su nodded his head. We'll be studying him too, Lin Mu stated, as well as the others. So why don't we get started? With that, their regular lessons began once more and lasted till it was the time for the matches. The lessons were helping the six companions a lot, and they were steadily improving. Unknown to them, Lin Mu was laying a foundation that they would rely on for millenniums to come.